I first learned about Bud Light Lime watching the Colbert Report. <laughs> Stephen used to drink it on camera and advertise it, and I always loved that show. So I tried it out, and he was right. It is great. Personally, I like Stephen's old show better than the new one, but that's not the purpose of this video. The purpose of this video is for me to just sit and relax as best I can <laughs> and explain to you why I think Hillary lost the election. Now, what I'm going to say may sound very anti-woman, uh, anti-democratic party, but I assure you that's not the case. And I want to give you a little bit of my background so you'll know exactly where I'm coming from. My name is David Mills. I will be 58 years old in January, and I have lived for 58 years in this house, in this room. I have invariably voted for the Democratic Party. I have never once in my entire life cast a vote for a Republican. My daughter worked for Hillary in the state of Ohio. I homeschooled my daughter. My daughter never entered a classroom until she started college. She's hoping to become an attorney, uh, a profession in which historically women have been discriminated against. So there is no stronger advocate for women's rights than I have. You ladies out there, I don't care how much time you've spent with your children, I've spent more. I don't know how few times you've left your kids with a babysitter, but it's not as few as in my situation. I never had a babysitter one time in 18 years, not once. And so the reason I bring up these seemingly irrelevant points is to show you that I am a lifelong Democrat. I very much empathize with women's issues, with domestic issues. And so I want to tell you on that basis why I think Hillary lost the election. The, the short answer is that she deserved to lose the election. I'm going to get more detail in a moment. But she had all the money, all the expertise, a wonderful ground game of which my daughter was a part. Uh, I think that, that even Donald Trump would admit in private that, that Hillary knew a lot more about the issues uh, than he did. Uh, so why then uh, did uh, Hillary lose? Particularly, remember, when the Democrats have an advantage in the, in the Electoral College. California, you don't need to spend money there. New York, you don't need to spend money there. And so, historically, Democrats have had an advantage in the Electoral College. So with all of these things, the, the money, the experience, the uh, expertise, the Electoral College uh, uh, advantage, how the hell did Hillary manage to lose this election. Uh, and I uh, will address that after a couple of drinks. I have to go back two or three years to really start this story. Because part of the reason that Hillary lost is that the media, the news media, lost all of its credibility Nobody believed anything that he heard or she heard on, on television or in print. And so when the news media went to correct something ridiculous that Donald Trump said, which was like every other sentence he said, nobody believed it. So how did the media lose credibility? Well, I'm not going to go all the way back to the Iran-Iraq war and Judith Miller at the New York Times where she printed headline after headline about weapons of mass destruction and how that turned out to be bogus and the media therefore lost credibility. You know that already. Let, let me go back just to the, the government shutdown. 
a few years ago, where all of the Democrats, and I'm going to tie this in to the, the current campaign that was just lost. Um, the government shut down. All of the Republicans, most of the Republicans, were for the government shutdown, and the Democrats were against it. Well, the news media don't really care about being objective. Their thought is to gain advertising revenue, and their Nielsen statistics told them that approximately half of their viewers were Democrats and half were Republican. And so when the news media covered the government shutdown, they did not say, and the Republicans are causing the government to be shut down, and the, and the Democrats are fighting against it. No, they presented it as some 50-50, neutral, objective, hands-off story that Congress cannot decide about a budget, the President and Congress cannot decide, and so it left the impression that both sides were equally to blame. Even when the Republicans were saying, like Ted Cruz, oh no, 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 we want credit. Please tell everybody that we're the ones shutting the government down because that appeals to our Looney Tunes base. And the Democrats were saying, point out that we don't want this to happen. Stop trying to make this a neutral 50-50 thing. But the, the news media reported it as a 50-50 thing and the, the people saw through that. The viewers saw through that, that the Republicans were in favor of shutting down the government and the Democrats weren't. But the news media took this, this entirely hands-off, neutral uh, uh, attitude, which sounds like a long time ago, doesn't it? But so they lost credibility there. And then in order to compensate for this loss of credibility, the media went out of their way recently to become fact checkers. They're fact checkers. They had banners across the screen. We're fact checking this story. Well, the problem is that their fact checking was just whatever their own political views were. And so they went from one extreme of not having any objective reporting at all to just spouting whatever views they had. And so they lost credibility on both ends of the spectrum there. That's really an ancillary point, but one that I needed to make. Now let's start with the campaign. When Donald Trump came down the escalator with Melania there at Trump Tower, and one of the first things out of his mouth was that uh, Mexico is not sending us their best people. They're sending us their criminals, their rapists, and so forth and so on. Now, the news media gave Trump tremendous amounts of free publicity because he's entertaining. I made a trip from Huntington to Cleveland in, uh, I believe it was March, uh, to see Trump in person. Maybe I'll insert a picture here in the video. And he's very entertaining. And I'm glad that I went. I enjoyed it, even though, again, I didn't vote for Trump. But um, the news people gave Trump tremendous amounts of media coverage for free. And so then, in order, and they got criticized for that. Criticized. How could you give this man all this free publicity? So, in order, again, to compensate for that, they deliberately misrepresented a lot of what Trump said. Again, that hurt their own credibility, and therefore, during the primary, or excuse me, the general election, when they did try to set the record straight on what Trump had said that was ridiculous, nobody paid any attention. Now, Trump comes down the escalator and says that uh, they're not sending the, our best, Mexico, their best, uh, uh, some of them are criminals, some of them carrying drugs, they're rapists, and so forth. Um, the news people and the Democrats, of which I am one, misrepresented deliberately what Trump said. That Trump said that all Mexicans are rapists. All Mexicans are rapists. Well, did he really say that? No. 
he said that he, they're sending rapists. And the very next sentence, and many of them, some of them, I assume, are good people. So in other words, Trump did not say that all Mexicans are rapists. So there was this error called suppressed quantification. Suppressed quantification, meaning that the number of people that you're really talking about, or the percentage of people you're talking about, is somehow left out of your news report to give a deliberately false impression. And so this was repeated tens of thousands of times. Trump said Mexicans are rapists. Well, did he say all Mexicans are rapists? No, he didn't say that. Some of them are good people. Now, if you would ask the news media, do you believe that none of these people were rapists? No, we know that some of them were. Not many. A tiny, tiny percentage. But the, the, the point is that the news media deliberately misrepresented what Trump said in many cases. That was the first one. That all Mexicans were rapists. And so... To the Democrats, this was sweet music because they were just convinced that the Latino vote was going to carry them to victory in Florida. Did that work? Did it work? Did it? No, it didn't. Well, and then the next thing, the next way the news media lost credibility, and again, the reason I'm pointing out why the news media lost credibility was to show you why later on in the general election, when news people pointed out the ridiculous things that Trump said, that were ridiculous, nobody paid any attention. Trump made statements like that, that Rosie O'Donnell was a fat pig. Okay, now that's not very nice. I would never say that in public, even though it's kind of true, isn't it, really? But instead of reporting this as Trump says Rosie O'Donnell is a fat pig. It's Trump criticizes women. Anything Trump said about an individual woman was extrapolated to be a condemnation of all women. Like he said something, again in private, which was never intended to be public, about Carly Fiorina's face. Again, not nice. I'm not defending that in any way. But it was represented as being an indictment of all women. Did you hear how Trump talks about women? Well, I can't offhand think of anything that Trump said in generally about all women. I can think of what he said about Carly Fiorina or Rosie O'Donnell or, or uh, some other woman in particular but that was generalized to be an attack on all women. And even a lot of feminists said, well, if you attack one woman, you've attacked them all. But that, that is the sexist idea. Let me give you an, a good example. Trump said during the uh, campaign that Jeb Bush was low energy. Jeb Bush is low energy. Well, now I'm a man. I didn't consider that an attack on all men. I didn't think, well, Trump criticized me for being low energy. I thought, no, he criticized uh, Jeb Bush. And I didn't generalize that. I didn't distort that. Likewise, Trump said that Marco Rubio, he called him Little Marco, Little Marco. Well, I didn't think, well, Trump's calling all men little. No, he called Rubio little. He called Jeb Bush low energy. Those were individual uh, attacks against people. Again, I'm not defending those, but they weren't attacks against the whole male species, the whole male gender. Whereas when Trump said anything about a woman, it was sexist, it was misogynist, it was an attack against all women. And again, to the Democratic base, that's fine. They never even think about this. But to the, the independent voter, or the voter who's just lost his job, and this is going to be the heart of my video, as you'll see. This was the most irrelevant horseshit that ever was. Hillary's entire campaign was based upon the most petty, petulant, 
issues. While Trump was talking about people who had lost their jobs in Ohio and Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin, Hillary was talking about what he called Miss Universe fat. He called Miss Universe fat. Look how he talks about women. And again, I'm a Democrat and I've got, I'm not wealthy, believe me, but I've got plenty of money to pay the bills and do what I want and go where I want and so forth. So I live a very comfortable life. But I know people who have been laid off in this city where I live. There used to be quite a number, maybe a dozen or so, factories here where you could go and you'd turn in your application and they would hire you on the spot. My grandfather, a lifelong Democrat, could not read and could not write. It's not because he was stupid. It was for the same reason that you probably cannot read and write Chinese. It's not that you're stupid, it's just that you never learned how. You never learned how. And if you'd grown up on a farm with no electricity and no running water, I don't, I don't think you would have done as well as he did. But he got a job in a local factory, uh, Owens, Illinois, that, that uh, made glass bottles similar to the one I'm drinking out of. He was a lifelong Democrat. And his proudest moment was in 1960 when John Kennedy stood outside the factory in the cold in Huntington, West Virginia, and my grandfather got to shake hands with him. That was his highest moment. If, if you visited with my grandfather more than five minutes, you would have heard that story. And the reason that I became a Democrat, or I really had, you know, I grew up, everybody in my family was a Democrat. I remember, I think it was 1966, a midterm election. I was down at my grandfather's house about a mile down there. Of course, he's long since passed away. But um, I had an aunt, and my aunt said, well, we don't vote for president this year. It was a midterm, 66. But I always vote to keep, just to keep the Democrats in, in office. My grandfather shook his head. Good, yes. And everybody around my mom and dad and everybody there, good, good, good. Well, I didn't know what a Democrat was. But I guess since everybody else there was a Democrat, I was too. And I always have been because they represented the working people, the middle class, and the poor. And so all these factories in West Virginia and in Huntington closed. And there's nowhere for anybody to work. If you're not a neurosurgeon or a heart surgeon or a, uh, an attorney or, or something that requires years and years and years of training, a lot of people around here don't have any money to go to college if they wanted to. I know a lot of bright people who didn't go because they couldn't afford to go or they couldn't afford to pay their loans back. And so, back to the, to the thesis of this video of why Hillary lost. If you don't have any money, if you don't have a job, if you can't get your kids any Christmas presents, which appeals to you more? Somebody who probably does have psychiatric issues, who comes in and tells you that your factory was closed, it was moved away, you don't have any place to work, and I'm going to fix that. Now, he probably can't. But it, at least you get the impression from Trump that he understands you a little better. Where Hillary comes in and says, Did you hear what he said about Rosie O'Donnell? And so the reason Hillary lost and Trump won was that Trump talked about issues that affected people's lives. And Hillary didn't. Now, this is such a fundamental point that I feel a little bit embarrassed to, to make a video about this completely obvious point. But, you know, Podesta and, and, and Donna Brazile, 
you know, you completely lost sight of, of this fact, that, that people are interested in themselves, in their own lives, as Dale Carnegie taught us 75 years ago. You know, which is really more important to you? Did you hear a story that a million people just died in China from an earthquake? Or that you, your tooth hurts? You, your tooth hurts, which is really, honestly, more important. And most people say, well, the tooth, because that affects me personally. I care about those people. I'm sad about that. Maybe I'll pray for them. But my tooth is really on my mind more. And so people had had no jobs, really no hope. And, and Trump at least acknowledged that fact. Hillary didn't. She really didn't. And, and so the last week of the, of the campaign, Trump made God, I don't know how many stops, in Pennsylvania and Michigan and, and Ohio and North Carolina and, of course, Florida, all of the swing states. And Hillary completely ignored the Rust Belt because she was going to win with embittered female voters who would just rally to her support because Trump gobbled some Tic Tacs and, and kissed some woman next to an elevator. So the moral of that story is that there weren't quite enough embittered women to reach 270 electoral votes. But there were enough embittered men to reach 270 electoral votes. The media also lost credibility by being so blatantly hypocritical. Let me give you another example. Every day, people on television would make fun of Trump's appearance. Oh, look at his hair. Look at his orange complexion. Look how fat he is. And they made some absurd caricature of him every day and laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. I laughed too, making fun of, of his appearance. Fair game. He's a public person. But then when Trump said something even in private about someone's appearance, oh my God, how could anybody in this day of political correctness make fun of someone's appearance? Isn't that awful? What a horrible man he is to make fun of somebody's appearance. And now let's watch another skit making fun of Donald Trump. So there was a complete blindness to their own hypocrisy about, is it okay to talk about people's appearance or not? They had no consistent policy, and people saw immediately through that. But the media, right from the very beginning, were on maximum outrage. And so were the Democrats. Everything Trump said he is a sexist. He is a misogynist. He is a xenophobe. He is an Islamophobe. And so right from day one, they reached their maximum outrage level. And people quickly got tired of that. Not that they agreed with what Trump said, but they quickly became accustomed to the outrage that the media expressed. And so each new revelation, it was like the boy who cried wolf. You know, we had heard that so many times before that when Trump did say things that really were kind of ominous, people thought, ah, more of the same, more of the same. I've tuned the news media out. And I must say, from my own personal life, I absolutely worshipped Chris Matthews, Rachel Maddow, Lawrence O'Donnell, uh, Steve Karnacki, uh, Chris Hayes on MSNBC, and uh, I would I would watch all evening and sometimes watch the replays in the middle of the night. Uh, and I don't do that anymore. I mean, I don't watch Fox either, but uh, there's only so much maximum uh, hysteria 
that you can take. I want to give you a, <laughs> a funny example. I, I believe, yes, it was on a Thursday night, and I was watching, uh, I believe it was Lawrence O'Donnell, and the discussion was the latest revelation about Donald Trump, that he had kissed some woman against her will next to an elevator in Trump Tower. And I thought, oh shit, I've heard this. So I turned it off. I thought, well, I'm going to watch the football game. So I turned on NBC. They were having a football game. Interrupted the middle of the football game. Breaking news. Break, there's Brian Williams. We know what credibility he has. So there's Brian Williams on the entire NBC network now. I thought, oh God, has somebody been assassinated? Has there been an earthquake? What's the big news story? Trump is accused of kissing a woman against her will next to an elevator at Trump Tower. And I think this was the late 1980s or something. And so this was like tremendous news. I mean, they, they knew it wasn't news, but they thought this is some way to, to keep people watching the show, particularly the Democrats. And my point is that you reach a certain threshold, like the boy who cried wolf, that you hear these death-like uh, warnings so many times that it, that, that it becomes meaningless. And so when you hear another one, you know, like the one near the end of the campaign where Trump claimed he grabbed some woman in the pussy, which probably did happen. I'm not denying that it happened. I'm sure most of the things that Trump's accused of, he supposedly offered Jessica Drake $10,000 for sex. I have no doubt that that, that that happened, that he offered her that. Uh, I have no doubt about that. But... Um, you can only hear so many stories before you just tune it out. And so people tuned out the criticism of Donald Trump. Like Teflon Don. You've heard that phrase, Teflon Donald. But he was still talking about your jobs are going away, the foreigners are coming to kill us, which is sometimes true. You know, your Obamacare premiums are going up, and Hillary is the last week of the campaign with Miss Universe, uh, Mr. Trump has said I was a fat. Mr. Trump has said I gained a 55 pounds. Well, if my grandfather had been laid off from his job and couldn't make his mortgage payment, he wouldn't have given a flying fuck if, if Donald Trump called Miss Universe fat. I mean, do you honestly think that this resonates with people, you Democrats? Now, there, there is a certain subcategory of man-hating, embittered, petulant, militant feminists that, that you know, if, if you have any libido at all, you know, if you're a man and, and you, like, want to fuck every woman you ever met that's not part of your immediate family, you know... There's no acceptance of male human nature. So what's generally called misogyny, hatred of women, is like a projection of the women of misandry, which means hatred of men. You couldn't say that Donald Trump hates women. You couldn't say that Bill Clinton hates women. You couldn't say that Tiger Woods hates women. No. <laughs> they have the opposite problem. They're too attracted to women. And so women, a, a small minority of women, don't like this. I mean, nobody wants to be groped. Or, that's not what I'm saying. But the fact that, that men have a libido, that men, including me, essentially want to fuck every woman they ever met. Old, young, fat, thin, black, white, Asian, it doesn't matter. If you're not in my immediate family, I want to fuck you. Okay? And this is the way all women, uh, excuse me, <laughs> That's the way all men are. And women, most women, recognize that. Now, that doesn't mean you behave in, in an obnoxious, 
groping, undiplomatic way. You won't find any woman on YouTube or Facebook or any woman who knows me who will ever say that I said anything inappropriate, did anything inappropriate. That's not the person I'm, I am. But this is male human nature. And uh, to, to, to think this way, and most women accept that. Hillary, in response to all these things Donald Trump did, she should have said, well, that's very inappropriate. Men will be men. Let's move on to the subjects at hand. And then talked about issues that were relevant to the people's lives, God damn it. What affects them? Their prescription costs, their health care premiums, their jobs, getting their kids into school, uh, the, getting the kids student loans that's not going to cripple them. But this, I don't know what she would have done. I, I'm probably better informed than you are on a lot of these things. I have no idea what she would have done in her first hundred days. I know what Trump said. He probably won't do them or accomplish them, but I, at least he made some uh, plan that, that people could grasp. So Hillary did not address the issues that people were concerned about. And from a feminist point of view, she was the worst possible candidate you could possibly offer because she was so ultra petty and petulant. Oh, he said, he, th look at her face, or Miss Universe was fat, or he wanted to fuck some woman somewhere, or he told somebody on The Apprentice that he'd like to see her down on her knees, or some shit like that. And, you know, I've obviously never met Hillary Clinton. I don't know her. And I am a lifelong Democrat. Keep that in mind. Nonetheless, by the end of the election, I really felt that Hillary Clinton personally hated my guts. I really felt that Hillary Clinton personally hated my guts, even though I've never met her and I'm a lifelong Democrat, because she said not one thing that resonated with me. Let me share you a, a little story with me and my daughter. My daughter and I eat very frequently at a local restaurant called Jim Steak and Spaghetti House. <clears throat> I remember my daughter worked for the campaign. Very, very well informed on all the issues. And I said to my daughter that Hillary um, addressed a lot of women-specific issues. She addressed uh, female issues all the time. And I said, but she never addressed any male-specific issues issues. Well, my daughter, very well informed, looked very perplexed. Male specific issues and she couldn't think of any. She couldn't think of any. And that kind of summarizes why Hillary lost. Because men were not taken into consideration. Her entire campaign was about riling up enough women and Latinos to get to 270. Well, let me give you a male-specific issue, by the way, in case you're wondering. Uh, men of my age group, our life expectancy is going down fast. All other life expectancy uh, women, Latinos, even African American, is going up. Men in my age group, the life expectancy is going down from drug addiction, uh, suicide, and just all kinds of horrible shit. Well, I don't think Donald Trump or, or Hillary could do anything about that. Uh, but can you acknowledge the issue? Can you at least acknowledge what's going on? That men exist. 
and, and you know, Donald Trump, would, I'm going to bring your job back. We're going to bring coal mining jobs back here to West Virginia. Well, shit he is. Shit he is. He's not. There's nothing anybody can do. That's the past. But he at least acknowledged the problem. Hillary didn't. Hillary didn't.